let's dive right into our subject, which is overheating in cameras. This is something that has been uh, very interesting for us and for our audience. This is a Cinedy Gear News video. Hi guys, I'm Johnny from Cinedy, and today with me is Matt from Panasonic. Matt, how are you? I'm doing well, Johnny. How are you? Everything is okay. Thank you for asking. And um, we're going to talk today about a very interesting topic, which is overheating in cameras. And this is a discussion that we would love to make with different manufacturers. And Panasonic is the first one because your cameras are not overheating so quick. And of course, this is very interesting for us to understand a little bit more and share this knowledge with our audience. So let's jump into the topic. And let me ask you first, why DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, why actually do they overheat? Well, first of all, in general, the main components that are heat sources are the image sensor and the imaging processor, or the LSI. Uh, these play an extremely important role in achieving the high image quality people are expecting from their cameras and also the high level of functionality. Uh, it's important to note that recently high speeds, high frame rates, uh, higher bit depths, higher resolutions are putting a lot bigger load on the image processing. In addition, things like uh, 42210 bit, as an example, having all intro recording with lower compression and higher bit rates, uh, VFR functions that go up to 180 frames per second or even beyond, all have an impact on the thermal generation of the camera. And then the higher speeds of different types of media, like CF Express cards, they can also generate more heat as well. So if we look at the image sensor, for example, um, the larger the sensor is, the higher the pixel count of the image sensor will have a pretty significant bearing on heat generation as well. And then when we look at things like the in-body image stabilization systems, uh, you're effectively asking the sensor to float in space. And because of that, it also has um, an impact on how well we can dissipate the heat in the sensor. So besides uh, safety issues, what can actually happen to the camera uh, internally when it overheats um, or to the, even the recorded media? Can, can the, the file can be damaged or anything? Yeah, so when we first look at um, what can happen with thermal issues, number one, we want to look at the fact that uh, you can have image quality degradation. So um, it's, it's apparent and easily proven that as thermal temperatures rise, you begin to see noise across the sensor. But you can also experience things like dark shading in the image, um, which can cause problems as well. And then long term, we have components inside the camera that can break down and eventually fail. You know, whether it's the LSI or if it's system components, um, things that are processing the audio signal, all of those items have the ability to be broken down and damaged, but it also extends to the camera's battery. Um, constant discharging and charging of a battery at very high temperatures, frankly, it reduces the lifespan of that battery as well. And then to your question, can it cause a problem to the memory card? I think the bigger issue is that there's a catastrophic failure in the camera because it overheats without ending the file. That's the real issue I would be worried about, is that I could lose a file if the camera thermals and has to end recording without wrapping the recording. Um, cameras can be replaced, but you're not going to be able to replace the I do moment at a wedding ceremony. So for us, it's making sure we can complete the file without damaging it. You already uh, mentioned what can stress the camera when it comes to overheating and that's, you know, different codecs, resolutions, frame rates, and so on. But how about internal raw recording? This is a question that I've been asking myself for quite some time because uh, when you're recording raw, I'm not so sure how much processing in terms of encoding is happening. Yeah, I think it's kind of a misconception, right? Because the assumption is that you have to um, process a raw image and then encode it into a codec before you write it. And so the encoding process takes up, you know, en engine cycles, and then we're writing that information as well. And so the theory would hold that it should generate more heat. But you also have to keep in mind that if we're writing in raw, we're actually putting an increased demand on the components that have to write those much larger files. So it's sort of a, a give or take, really. We're giving you less processing that's required to compress the image file but then we're taking away that efficiency 
by increasing the data rate that we're having to send that information into your recording media. So it's really a six and one and a half dozen of the other situation in that regard. So different manufacturers are trying to uh, combat this overheating or actually cooling the camera in different ways. Some have uh, yeah. special bodies, heat sinks, uh, fans, and so on. Can you elaborate a little bit about the different techniques? Well, with Panasonic, we try to use a, a holistic approach to how we um, deal with thermal issues. So it's always going to start with how do we get the heat from the most critical components, um, those components being the engine and the sensor primarily. So um, obviously the best way to do this is to try to mount that device directly to a heat sink of some type. Um, maybe use a piece of copper and then apply some thermal grease that's very efficient at bonding that heat to the copper and then allow that copper to come in contact with aluminum to pull it into the atmosphere. Um, we also do some really in-depth modeling of our cameras using finite element analysis to determine where that heat is going and to figure out ways to bolster the design of the chassis of the camera to pull that heat out away from those critical components and get them out into the atmosphere where they won't cause any damage to the camera. Um, it's interesting, I've heard some people sometimes say when they touch a camera, if it's warm, that must be a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it's the exact opposite. If you touch a camera and it's warm to the touch, that means the heat's getting out of the camera and it's getting into the atmosphere and away from those critical components. Um, and then in certain extreme situations, like with the S1H or the BGH1, um, because we are putting such a processor heavy load on those cameras, um, obviously in the case of the S1H, the full frame sensor, in the case of the BGH1, adding things like uh, um, Genlock generation and SDI, which it adds thermal process, it adds processing load. Um, we've added a fan system to be able to cool it down. And again, even there is a balancing act because we have to design a fan that's quiet and can move that air while simultaneously keeping the chassis cool enough to be useful. Thank you for that. And I have to um, move into the next question, which is as, as professionals, you know, we, we are working in different conditions, different assignments, uh, different uh, environments and so on. So the working field is always changing. Now, uh, um, manufacturers on the other side will always try to kind of excuse themselves and say, camera can work in a certain temperature for whatever certain uh, amount of time. With Panasonic, I, I have to say, I, I never saw any type of this kind of exception, but it will not work in, in, in a certain condition. How can you guarantee something like this? How can you guarantee, for example, that your cameras, I think most of them, will uh, you will guarantee kind of uh, uh, a longer period of uh, video recording in 40 degrees Celsius. How can you guarantee something like this? Well, it, I think it first starts with you have to identify what your design targets are, Johnny. So, you know, we clearly define what our design target is, which is that our cameras will operate as promised from zero to 40 degrees Celsius for the U.S. It's, that's 32 degrees to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, cameras like the S1.8, certain GH models, they'll go a little bit further in the freezing temperatures, like negative 10 Celsius, which is 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you first have to define what your operating range is, and then you're going to design the camera to that operating range, and then you're not going to make compromises in your design principles. So when we say it operates from zero to 40 degrees Celsius, that's full stop. There is no asterisk because we've designed it to do that. So by setting the design principle first, then you can start going into making the design decisions that are necessary. So we can go into the design and say, uh, we have to make this camera slightly larger because we need a certain amount of heat dissipation for us to, be able to get that heat away from the engine and the sensor. Um, we will make decisions about the fan accordingly based on those design principles. So I think the key is that you, you make a commitment to what you're gonna design the product to, and then you just design the product to operate there. It's a pretty simple process. Um, at Panasonic, we just don't believe in asterisks. We think that if we make a commitment that we've promised you an operating range, that the product should do everything we've promised within that operating range. We're gonna take your word for it. You know, this is a, this is a very, it's a commitment here, <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure that you checked this very well with your engineers and obviously um, the cameras are performing in harsh conditions. And this is bringing me to the next question, which is your current flagship camera is the Lumix S1H. Uh, how would you differentiate that camera from the competitors? 
when it comes uh, into working, when you compare it to working in uh, really harsh conditions? Well, I think if I'm completely honest with you, I can't locate another cinema camera that is going to produce the image quality of the S1H that can operate from uh, 14 degrees to 104 degrees Fahrenheit that is dust resistant, splash resistant, and freeze resistant. And so I think it sort of lives without peer. It's the most ruggedized design cinema camera that you can currently purchase. That would be our uh, opinion of the S1H. And if I take the new, the new camera, the, the S5, the Lumix S5, with that camera, you actually decided to limit the recording time to 30 minutes. Is this is because of uh, overheating issues or there's another reason for that? Yeah, so when we put a recording limit, it's going to be because there's the potential for a, the product to fail at certain operating temperatures. So in that camera, if you're recording at like, let's say 35 degrees Celsius, um, which is in the 90 to 95 degree range in the United States, um, that product would record for an unlimited recording time. Um, there's no reason for us to put a stop point. It's when we get above that temperature, it's when we get to closer to 100 degrees, 104 degrees, um, you know, that realistically, there's just not enough surface area on that camera to dissipate the heat and allow us to have an unlimited recording time. It would probably stop roughly 40 minutes, give or take, if we didn't put that 30 minute limit in there. And so to protect people's data, we put that limit in. And I realize that some people will ask, well, why don't you give us a high temperature operating mode where we can run it at 90 degrees or 95 degrees, but that's not the design goal. Our design goal is 104 degrees. That's the commitment we make to you. And so, because that's our commitment, we have to abide by it. That's our principle. This is clear. One more question related to, related to the Lumix S5. Uh, the recovery time, when I, when I talk about recovery time, when, when the camera stops at uh, 30 minutes, sometimes it's simple, uh, simply, you know, you just click record again and the camera will continue to record. How do you assure this kind of very short recovery time? Again, it's, it's about getting the heat out away from the components inside the camera and getting them into the chassis of the camera. Now, your experience may be different because you may be operating in certain temperature extremes that don't put a lot of pressure on the outside of the chassis. Um, I couldn't promise that kind of recovery time if I'm in the middle of the Sahara Desert and I'm directly under sunlight. Um, <clears throat> for faster recovery times, you should put the camera into a shade. Uh, I, I was one time shooting the S5, it was 100 degrees outside, and I was under direct sunlight, and I got, you know, the, the camera ended up shutting down about 30 minutes in. Um, I ended up just bringing it into the house really quick. I just put it over by an air conditioning vent, and Five minutes later, I got another you know, 30, 40 minutes recording out of the camera easily. I think the key here is that you have to understand the environment around the camera. If the environment around the camera isn't direct sunlight and it's 90 degrees-ish, um, which is like 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, um, the camera will have enough um, surface area to be able to dissipate its heat to get itself back to where it needs to be. It's in the extreme temperature conditions where you might have to make some compromises, put it in the shade or put it near something cooler. Matt, we are talking here about overheating issues. Um, and my question is, is there any industry standard, actually something that uh, put things into place? And if yes, is Panasonic following that standard or how about other manufacturers? Yeah, absolutely. There are two standards that we're working toward. In fact, there's one and it's been modified to a second standard. Um, you have IEC slash UN slash UL uh, CSA 60950, um, um, that's really exciting, but if you want to go out and search for it, it's out there. Um, uh, it's been ratified to IEC slash EN slash UL slash CSA 62368. Um, these are quality assurance standards, and as a part of the testing methodologies, they require operating ranges from zero to 40 degrees. Um, these are safety standards to ensure people aren't, damn, aren't hurt by the product, but they're also quality assurance standards that say, what the manufacturer has rated the product to operate toward, um, it will actually deliver those as promised. So that's what we follow as to what other people are doing. I couldn't tell you what other companies are doing. Matt, I would like to conclude, uh, at least from my side, this is the last question. And I want to talk about kind of uh, reliability uh, assurance. From as far as you are concerned, 
the Lumix, uh, the Panasonic Lumix cameras. What are the temperatures that people can feel very comfortable to work with and the camera will perform with high reliability? Well, so again, there's no asterisks here. Um, if you look at the owner's manual, you'll see the bulk of our cameras um, in like the G series and the, and the S series will operate from zero to 40 degrees Celsius, which comes out to um, roughly 32 degrees, 204 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. When we look at some of our higher professional level cameras, which is the S1 through the S1H and uh, cameras like the GH5, GH5S, uh, we give you a lower operating temperature. Um, they'll go down 10, negative 10 degrees Celsius, which is roughly 14 degrees Fahrenheit. They still operate up to 40 degrees um, Celsius, up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's our prescribed operating range. Now, obviously you have to keep in mind, uh, not in direct sunlight. <laughs> that would be the only real caveat I'd give. If you're at 104 degrees under direct sunlight, that's gonna accelerate the, the time it'll have, have to stop recording. But as long as you're operating within the range we promised in the owner's manual, there's no caveats. Good. Matt, that's what I love about our job. Every day you learn something new. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm very, you know, I, I ask everything that I wanted to, to ask. Is there anything that you would like to um, uh, to contribute something something else to the conversation? No, I just thank you for tackling this topic. Um, obviously, at Panasonic, it's something we're very passionate about. And we're excited that you're going to uh, educate your audience about how different manufacturers give quality assurance and how their products perform. Um, obviously, it's it's an important aspect of the camera and it's something people should be considering before they make a purchase decision. So, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. And guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you like this type of conversation about overheating and if you would like us to continue with a mini-series and talk to other manufacturers about that exact topic, please let us know in the comments below. And of course, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you, guys.